and welcome everyone. Very many thanks for the enthusiastic thumbs up you collectively gave to our first talk last week. If you missed Cathy Hunt's talk on Mary MacArthur, you can catch up with it on the library's YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash WCM library. Today's talk will be uploaded there shortly too. And welcome particularly to our speaker, Paul Miles, who joins us live from Lewis. In 2009, Paul saw, oversaw a major festival in Lewis to mark the 200th anniversary of Thomas Paine's death, which led to the publication of two books, which he'll be telling us more about. He's also a board member and officer of the Thomas Paine Society UK. Our talks are as usual free, however, we'd like to encourage you to support the library if you're able to do so, while acknowledging that there will be many other demands on your funds. The page to click to is wcml.org.uk forward slash donate. And Paul is now sharing the screen and you will see on screen little pictures of meeting attendees as well, perhaps, if you're new to Zoom. At the very top left are these little pictures. You have buttons which enable two important options for you. You can either click hide thumbnail or the show small active speaker video option, depending on whether you want to see Paul as he speaks alongside his presentation or not. So just to say that again, at the very top of the little pictures of attendees you can see, you can either click hide thumbnail or show small active speaker video option. So now I hope the main thing you are seeing on your screen is the start of Paul's presentation. Paul, big thanks again, and over to you to tell us more about the rise of Thomas Paine and the case of officers of excise. Thank you very much and uh, welcome all. It's a privilege and uh, an honour for me uh, to be able to give this talk to the Working Class Movement Library, because I consider this uh, particular document is a, has got a natural home there. Um, you'll see later, but the, the big claim, the big takeaway from this uh, research has been that this this document that Payne wrote in Lewis in 1772 uh, represents the first national unionization of workers ever in the world. So it's a pretty big claim but you'll see that um, we can make that claim with some confidence. You'll see what goes on behind it. It's a bit surprising how it all turns out and it, it took a while to get there. But just to put the, um, the whole thing in context, um, I'd like first just to, uh, for us all to look at Thomas Paine here. This, this came up uh, when we did the festival in 2009, which I was asked to do just to give you the background for that. I'd, I'd um, organised some fairly major sculpture exhibitions in, our, in a quite big town hall in Lewis, uh, Rodan in Lewis. You can see some of the images behind me there. We made the kiss down from the tape. And, Henry Moore, uh, David Nash, Sir Anthony Carr, over 10 years. So I was used, I knew the people in the town hall and they were used to be organising. So they asked me to do this very different thing, which is to celebrate Thomas Paine's life um, uh, because he lived in Lewis for the last six years of his young life uh, before he left these shores for the North, what was then the North American colonies. So um, he features quite large in Lewis because of this fact. He was an officer of excise here. Um, and he, he, he figures large here and he figures large in Thetford as well because that's his birthplace. So the two of us, uh, all the officers, can either come from Thetford or, or Lewis. Uh, in actual fact, we, we, he's very much alive here. This image really hasn't been out there before. Uh, we employed uh, Tim Wilcox, uh, an expert picture researcher, and he was previously a curator at Dulwich uh, picture gallery, so of some note himself, uh, because we didn't really, when, when we looked at it, I was asked to do this, uh, re you know, put this festival on, which we did, it was over 10 days, we had 2,000 different activities, it was very successful, we got on the television and, you know, there was a lot of, everyone had a great time, we shut the town, the whole town down on one occasion and had a huge Thomas Paine tune nail dance right down the middle of town, it was fantastic. But um, we, we didn't realise on the run in that we didn't know very much. And so the first thing we did was, was ask Tim to look for images. So it's these images I want to briefly talk about. This is a photograph of a painting and you, you probably can't see it, it's a bit dark, but up there it says Thomas Paine, London, 1790. It's not signed, which is quite common for that time. 
And this is a photograph of a painting. Uh, that this photograph lies in a box in the Heinz archive, which is the uh, National Portrait Gallery archive. It lies behind the National Portrait Gallery and there are boxes with images of everyone in there and Payne's got one box to himself, King George III has got 20 boxes, that sort of thing. And this photo lies in there. We don't know who painted it, we don't know where the painting is. So if anyone's ever seen this anywhere, please, you know, answers on a postcard please we'd love to know um, so uh, but I particularly like this one the original the, the sharp engraving uh, is from the original Romney uh, of pain which is lost the the sharp engraving which many of you would have seen is very good uh, but from then on in it really descends into a more caricature like uh, image of pain and ends up almost cartoon like if you look on the the Portrait Gallery's website. I like this one because he actually looks like, you know, in the flesh here, a confident man, well-dressed in, in his midlife. This is 1790s, the, the, the War of Independence is, is over, he's returned to London, and he's with, living with Cleo Rickman writing The Rights of Man. So uh, anyway, that's just a brief little story about this because the National Portrait didn't acquire the painting we don't know why um, I, I, there was a bit of a question in my, in, in my mind about it but, but what happened at the end of the exhibition the festival was someone contacted me we'd been on the television and what have you and said I'm a descendant of Thomas Paine I think I'm a descendant of Thomas Paine so we're pretty sure that wasn't likely but uh, nonetheless I agreed to meet this person well, they came up on a Saturday afternoon up the steps of my house and when they got to the top of the steps, the blood ran cold in my veins because they absolutely looked like this person. It was stunning. Uh, I, over two occasions we had meetings and we uh, established beyond any reasonable doubt that this person was a descendant of Thomas Paine's father's brother, so Thomas Paine's uncle. So it was great to get that living link to this image. So moving on. Um, let's just get the next slide up. So the next image that came up was this rather beautiful image. This is a very big painting. It's nearly two metres wide and a metre high, uh, painted by Dominique Serres. And this is of Lewis in 1760, eight years before Payne comes to town. I'd like to show this one because the details are fabulous and there's a bit of political history over the next two paintings uh, that you can see. Um, so this is Lewis from the South, this is the Spa of St Michael's where Thomas Paine married Elizabeth Olive. Um, Ball House is about there where he lived, uh, the White Hart is around there where, which was the office for the exercise officers which Paine would normally have lodged with, he would normally have stayed there but on this occasion he stayed with Samuel Olive, the High Constable in Ball House, the senior High Constable. The shaft of sunlight bathes Pelham House. This is the Duke of Newcastle's house. You, live, you had a house near Lewis. Uh, there were contested elections in Lewis. It, wasn't, it was not a rotten borough. And Newcastle had to spend quite a lot of money getting it either himself or his people elected. So Payne rode into um, uh, eight years later. And eight years later, Ceres came back again and painted this image. It's, it's a quarter of the size of the previous image, so it's not, he hasn't overlaid anything, it's painted again. And this time, the, the Pelham house is not bathed in sunlight. Uh, Henry Shelley, who commissioned Ceres, Dominic Ceres, later marine painter to King George III, a very exacting artist. Um, Newcastle died in this year and, and Henry Shelley, who, who was acting as his agent before, apparently had had some kind of an argument. So it's interesting to know this, but it's lovely to see that the, the, my hometown of Lewis, the town that Thomas Paine rode into as an out the four, on the fourth outride of excise as an officer in 1768. If he'd have stood in this spot, this is what he this is what he would have seen. So I just wanted to show you that to put this into context. Uh, what happened out of that first um, festival was we produced a book on that occasion, 
which, uh, because the Lewis Railway Station asked me la late last year to put an exhibition of Thomas Paine on their rather large railway station, they've got five waiting rooms there. And I said I could if I republished the book that we published in 2009, uh, which has been updated with extra essays. So this is, this is one of the books that is for sale now, which I recommended reading. It's um, a cheap download uh, on Kobo. Uh, I think the links will go up on the website later, or you can buy it print on demand, or I can send you one. Um, so, uh, and it's more like an introduction, which raised the research question in a way that I carried on working over the next eight years. So, uh, moving on from that, this is what this talk is about. This is the uh, the rise of Thomas Paine, and we're. we're I'd like to qualify that statement. Why is it the rise? The, re the research question that was left, we know that Thomas Paine wrote this, this pamphlet. Um, and it's a pamphlet, there are two parts to this, what I've claimed is the national unionization, which is the case, which is an argument. The case is a pamphlet of some 23 pages. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. I've got that written down somewhere. I keep forgetting it. But it's a detailed, in sections, it's a detailed explanation of why the office, his fellow, nearly 3,000 nationwide officers need better pay and they need better working conditions. And he goes through it slice by slice, action by action. And it's an ext the more you, the more I thought about that, the more it, it had become clear to me that pain could not have just done this on his own. The popular, the first biographer of Payne claimed that he's just a troublemaker and he got a few of his mates together and he did this thing. Well, you, you couldn't really do that now, let alone in the 18th century. Uh, the, the, this was a, one of the biggest organizations in the world, the, the civil, under the civil service, they worked for the king, collecting inland revenue. Uh, to support the king and to support the secret service and, and, and to pay some other things to do with the crown. So why, why, why was paying, the biggest question in my mind was really okay, whether he couldn't have done this, but why was, why choose pain? He, he, he wasn't of any great birth, he was a very lowly birth, um, uh, and he wasn't of any great education, he certainly didn't have any money, so the case is about getting more money. And so, well, this is what was, uh, you know, the research question remained after that festival. This is uh, the first inner pages there, which um, he, he outlines here, the numerous evils arising, arising to the revenue from the insufficiency of the present salary, and he addresses it to the Right Honourable and the members of both Houses of Parliament. Nearly 4,000 copies of this pamphlet were printed, one for every excise, officer in the country and uh, for both members of Houses of Parliament that were sent to important business people in each county and each collection. A huge effort and this this was printed in Lewis by William Lee, the same man that printed the local newspaper, the first newspaper actually in Sussex founded in 1746. Um, uh, Lee uh, published this weekly newspaper, which we'll talk about a bit later, but he also, he also the, printed these copies of the case. So there's two parts to the case, uh, uh, to this effort. One is this case, and the, and the other one, it accompanies a petition. So there's a two-pronged, it's a two-pronged, and what I'm about to go into now is that we had to re-find this was flagged up um, well by a previous member of the society called George Highmarch, who was an officer of excise himself. Uh, he died about uh, 15 years ago, but he had a lifelong fascination with pain, and he was able to access and interpret the 18th century excise records in a way that exposed Paine's character and started this story, but he didn't reference anything. We had to go and find everything. So we had to, this is a forensic trial, which has taken uh, not full-time research, it's taken about 10 years of internet and fairly serious research. So there, there, here we are, just to, just to sort of drill home what, what we really think about this and, 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 and the mystery behind it in a way. I noticed that it's flagged up as a hidden history and this certainly was until we did this work. Uh, so 
I said it's a natural home in the working class movement library. Uh, it's the first national unionization. But it's, it didn't come about how you would expect. And this is um, the, the, the most surprising thing is, is it wasn't organized from the bottom of, of the exercise service. It was organized from the very top. And Payne was selected to write the case uh, for reasons that we've discussed. We're fairly sure why now. Uh, uh, but he was selected from the top from a man that had been very near the crown. George Lewis Scott was, had previously been tutor to the, uh, to the King George III in his minority. So he was very, very close to the royal family. Right, so I'm going to trot through the clues now. I've got about another 20 minutes, I suppose, uh, to, to just get this story uh, through to you and then I'll answer questions afterwards. But obviously there's a lot for, you know, 10 years research in 20 minutes, so bear with me. It's a fairly fast trot. The first clue came from a letter written by uh, Thomas Paine to the great Oliver Goldsmith, the, the great playwright, the friend of Samuel Johnson. They, they, he belonged to the club. Uh, they met in the Turk's Head. He knew everybody. Garrick, Goldsmith, the, the, the great Samuel Johnson, they were all there and they loved Goldsmith, uh, Goldsmith very well known by this time. And this is the letter, I'm just going to show you the letter and then some details of the letter. I'm just going to show you the letter so you, to show you what it looks like. So that's Thomas Paine's Fair Hand, which I was able to uh, buy from the British Library, a very high resolution digital copy of this, which I, this is what you see here. And here we are, this is, um, there's the date, there's his signature. Uh, he never does meet Payne. He never does meet Goldsmith, I mean. Uh, many biographies, and there's about two biographies a year about Payne, they're rather loosely written, most of them, I'm afraid, some are more exacting, Bill Speck was better. But many make bits up where there's bits missing, and, and they tend to echo the first biographer, uh, Francis, um, George Chalmers, writing under the name of Francis Alford, Aldous, who was paid £500 to defame Payne after Rising Man by the Pitt government. So um, he's quite assiduous. He gets a lot of his facts right, but he doesn't miss a trick of, of, of running Payne down. And many biographers go back to that and don't see through uh, these details, which we think we've unearthed for the, f the first time here. So in this letter, Payne says it himself, the letter's been out there for a long time. It says here, don't forget he's written the case of the Office of Excise, but he says here, a petition for this purpose has been circulated through every part of the kingdom and signed by all the officers therein. Wow. I mean, that's, you think about that, that's a big, that's a big thing. And the other thing about him being a rabble rouser and just doing it himself, he actually writes here, um, this is my first and only attempt, and even now I should not have undertaken it, taken it had I not been particularly applied to by some of my superiors in office. So there, he says it. He, he didn't make this up. He was asked to do this from, from above his superiors. So there they are. Clues. Um, so as we follow this through, we, we tracked this document down, which is... Uh, which showed up to be a device that, that George Lewis Scott, and it's George Lewis Scott we concentrate on here. There are plenty of clues later that bind Payne to Scott. Scott introduced Thomas Payne to Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Fr at the end of all this, and you'll see why. Uh, and ben, uh, Benjamin Franklin wrote him a letter of introduction to America which catapulted Payne uh, very, very soon. He was editing the Pennsylvania Magazine, and very soon after that, he penned Common Sense, which is the single document that kindled the War of Independence, acknowledged by Washington, all the other founding fathers. Payne is seen as a founding father of the United States of America. He actually coins that phrase in one of the 13 crisis papers he, he wrote to steady the troops during the American War after common sense. So here we are, this is a letter to the nine commissioners of excise from a committee of eight, and you can see down here, eight ordinary officers of excise, and there's our man Thomas Payne there, 
And these, these offices are dotted all over the country. I lay that out on the book. Now, it was a device well known in the 18th century that if you wanted to get something done, you want to make yourself look bigger, and also you could, you could hide a bit in a group. So this is a committee. I don't believe this committee ever actually existed. I think this is one of the constructs. But this is a letter to the commissioner of officers, the eight or sometimes nine men that run the excise service. They sat in Broad Street in London and they surveyed the minute books came to them every month so they could make decisions about where they were going to put officers, who they were going to dismiss, who they were going to take on, who they were going to promote. So this is asking, saying that there's a case and a petition and could we have some more money, please? Because their pay had been frozen for a hundred years by statute. There was inflation in the country and they were really struggling. And you can see this in the case. They were, they were these very intelligent men, uh, highly qualified to gauge casks and, and calculate gravity of liquids, were earning about the same as a labourer. And they were removed from where they lived. They couldn't get support from their families and they had to pay for lodgings and were on a horse. This is the next document, the, the, kind of the smoking gun really. And this is written from the commissioners of excise to the treasury saying, look, we think they have a case here. You know, we've, we've been sent this by a committee of eight from all over, from uh, 3000 officers. And uh, we think this should come before you. And here's our man, uh, George Lewis Scott, he's our operator here, who a very competent mathematician, he sat on the board of Longitude, awarding the prize to Harrison for, for inventing the, um, the very accurate, accurate timepiece that Mariners used. Uh, he communicated with other mathematicians in the, in, in the country, trying to figure out how to to, to make the country run better. And it's strongly suspected he was brought into the excise service to reduce corruption, which was known to be a problem. This is the petition and the case being forwarded to the Treasury to ask for uh, higher wages. This is the reply. The, the Treasury received it on the February the 5th, 1773. And on February the 9th, uh, Payne and George Lewis Scott, they all got their answer. It lies there, nil. They got nothing. They couldn't do it. Now, tracked it through the books. A lot of people were trapped in this inflation recycle at the time. The officers of the Navy were asking for more money. There were, there were requests coming into the Treasury from every, everywhere through various uh, routes. And Lord North said, if we pay one, we've got to pay it more and we just can't do it. Call them a bungling ministry, if you like. Um, they payments exposing corruption here. I think it's a mistake to think of corruption, and perhaps the way we think about it now. I think it was the only system. I don't think there was ever a time that it wasn't corrupt. If you read Pepys's diaries and what have you, you, you see it was quite normal to filch off money and to do side deals and what have you. So anyway, they get nothing, and that's the end of that. Um, the, this whole effort failed. So, but how did it get to this position? So, here we are. The, the problem with, um, with this whole bit of research was that although we had that case and we had the letter to Goldsmith, up until very recently, and I'm talking about two years ago now, we, there were, we couldn't see any signatures, we couldn't find this petition. So uh, this really bothered, you know, because we couldn't really answer this question without the petition and the signatures. We, we had, you know, we just had that letter uh, to say it. We needed, really needed to see the signatures. So I used to take, um, um, I was asked by the University of Sussex to further this research, which I did with Professor Watmore. And I was taking students up to the National Archives and we were fishing through the treasury boxes box after box after box. They're not catalogued. We, no one knows what's in them. But there's numbers on them. There's folio numbers on them. There's no description of what's in these boxes. So we would go up there day after day and very often found nothing. Until one day, lo and behold, there they were. It was such a moment to find this. I can't tell you how great this was. So we found two documents, um, not, not all 3,000, 
but enough to nail it, enough to, it took a, quite a bit of thinking after this, but enough to, to, to establish beyond any reasonable doubt, along with the minute book, that, that right, we have it, this is, this is how this came about. So here we are, These are this is from Wales and Hertfordshire, uh, the, the collection, there are 53 collections in England and they each had a super, they had a collector in, in each big region, Cornwall was a collection, uh, Wales was a collection, Hertfordshire was a collection. They would have a collector at the top of the pile, then they'd have a, offices all over the area with a supervisor in each one. And you can see the signatures here, it says what they are, the outright, the names, uh, and so on and so forth. And here on the top, so this would this was a petition, this piece of paper, it's a large piece of paper, with this with this petition on the top of it, which in very uh, much shorter language, a little bit clumsier, but 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 you uh, paint echoes this petition in the case. He picks up, he picks out the, the the main themes of this petition, which you can't read right now; it's too long. But what it says is, well, the problem was, and Payne had suffered this self, this himself in Afford, when he was first made an officer in Exford of excise in Afford, he was dismissed for stamping his ride, a form of corruption. And what that meant was he would stamp up his paperwork without actually going to see these people and, and say that he had been when he hadn't. And then, you know, maybe they paid some tax, maybe they didn't. There was all sorts of corruption going on. But the convention was if anyone reported this corruption upwards in any of the collections or under any of the supervisors, there was a national convention that it wasn't the person that was reported got the sack, the youngest person or the latest person into the service got dismissed. That was it. It wasn't fair, but that's what happened. And that happened to Pony and Afford. And it's, it's fairly clear that his supervisor, Swallow, was the corrupt one because he was found and dismissed for using Payne's orderly book some three months later. So that plot thickened, and it's uh, one of the things. There are certain things we still don't know is how deep was Payne into all of this. Uh, you know, was he was he did he orchestrate the national? It's it's hard to think he did that, but I think there were. Uh, this was certainly Scott, but he was plugged into this in a fairly. Uh, profound way because he was accepted back into the service very quickly he was uh, which wasn't unusual that did happen because there weren't that many people in the in the country that was capable of, of, of gauging and assessing excise and collecting it was a very dangerous job as well so men were discharged and taken back on <coughs> but the way pain was taken back on was quick he says in a letter that he was he was he couldn't be charged with any uh, charge of corruption. He says that himself, and he refused a post in Grand Pound before he came to Lewis, which meant he, he had some say in all this. So there we are. There's there's another petition, uh, uh, and you, you can see the paperwork. Uh, another clue that gave us more signatures. This was a, a fairly uh, important clue. This is the front of one of the um, one of the documents, one of these pieces of paper that would have had to travel around the the area to get these signatures. And if these were done locally, this tells us that was, this was done centrally. If these if these documents were created locally, they they wouldn't have crossed their own, you know, Scotland out and put Wales in instead. So it's obviously a mistake. That, that, that was made, low, you know, it was sent to the wrong place and across the output wires. And so that's quite an important clue, that one. So the other strand to this is the minute books. And the minute books, this big organisation um, that, that, that were kept up by the supervisors, uh, went up through the collectors, right up to the commissioners in London, and there were short character references. And there's a nice, there's a nice bit here, actually, because... High marks proved, and you, you, you can work it out for yourself, that Payne is of good character through these minute books and through his uh, journey through the excise. Uh, unlike Robbie Burns, uh, that's another book, it's another story, but, but he doesn't come out so well out of the minute books, actually. Nowhere near as well as Payne, but just the opposite. But we won't turn on Burns, this is about Thomas Payne. 
So at the same time that Payne rode into Tony Lewis in 1768, everything changed. There was a 20 page entry. Now normally these entries from these very collections are very short. You get two or three, two or three entries from each area and the minute it goes right through the country with all, all the removes and the movements and so on and so forth. 20, this was a 20 page entry from Cornwall where the corruption was so bad and you can see from the signatures and the petitions, this was happening at the same time in 1768, there was an exposure of corruption. So people could whistle blow on this occasion without getting the sack themselves. Supervisors got removed and the collector of Cornwall on this occasion was dismissed for the very first time. So again, this was, there were, so there were fairly large levers being pulled from the top here. So you can see the net drawing in here. So it wasn't just the case being written by Payne, it wasn't just the petitions, they were actually doing things out in the country and saying, look, we've had enough of this. And the extraordinary thing about this is, is Payne wasn't radical here. He wasn't a revolutionary. He was working with George Lewis Scott and many others, because if you think, if the convention was that the supervisor was always protected and the collector was protected, here they were being more or less forced to get those under them to sign, because what it says in that petition is they're fed up with being dismissed for, for telling the truth. So there, there would have been quite a lot of tensions here. So Payne just arrived in Lewis when this 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 twenty page entry from Cornwall, which which really put the final bit of the jigsaw in for us, and this is what they look like. This is actually the one. So and here they're saying they're whistleblowing here. Uh, the, the the records are wrong. They're not set up at the right time. And Payne in the case lays out in detail the types of corruption that goes on. The the backhanders, the mismeasurements, the um, all, all the tricks that, that, that were getting up to in the country, which were denying money from getting to the crown and running the country pro properly. I mean, that's the point here. Payne was actually trying to make it better in the UK. He's trying to make it better for his king. He was working for his king. Um, when it failed, I think they all gave up. I think that's when George Lewis Scott introduced him to Benjamin Franklin and off he goes. The other clue, there are more, is that this Lee, I mentioned him earlier on, uh, who was the proprietor, owner of the Sussex Weekly, uh, Sussex Weekly Advertiser or Lewis Journal, who printed the case. Um, I, I was looking at this on microfilm, very difficult thing to do. Um, eventually was able to digitise all the microfilm. Uh, they said, the library said no a few times, but eventually they said yes, it was great, and I got that done. Uh, it was a dump of PDF files onto my desktop with no classification whatsoever. So it's taken, I, I have to say, it's an ongoing process. I'm only through the first year properly yet. So it's another few books to come out of this and more clues, but there was enough to get going with this. And what happened was this, this was inflammatory. Um, the stories of Junius, some of you may have heard of, Wilkes. The country was in upset, there was a furore, the king was being attacked in the corrupt ministry, was being openly attacked right through this newspaper. And the fact that William Lee reprinted the, uh, the letters of Junius, who to this day, we don't know who he is, but he was the deep throat at the time, he knew everything in your wood, all the dirty secrets, he was publishing them in the public advertiser. William Lee reprinted those letters in this paper and would have risked his neck doing so. Payne wrote letters in this newspaper. Uh, he wrote letters about the iniquities of the Elizabethan Paul uh, law. Uh, a man arrived at the bottom of Keir Street because uh, he had to be returned to his parish of Lewis from York because he, he needed a relief. He could, you can only get that in your own parish at that time. And he died in an open car ridden with lice. And Payne said, this can't be right. He shows his humanity in this letter to the Sussex Weekly Advertiser or Lewis Journal. This is what it looks like, the newspaper. Uh, I've colour coded and analysed this, analysing it. Uh, these are the colour codes I use. Uh, so I dot it with colour and I classify everything that Junius was interested in, uh, Payne would have been interested in, 
Uh, for instance, the Boston Tea Party was reported on the front page of the Lewis newspaper while Payne was in town. And you'll see in the first book I've written that Thomas Jay's General Gage, the commander in chief of the British forces, also his ancestral home is five miles away in Lewis. They, Payne and Gage probably walked the high street of Lewis at the same time. Both members of the American Philosophical Society, just extraordinary. So um, there's an essay, a couple of essays about that in, in my book. This is what classification looks like. It's taken all the time. So each one of these is a year of the newspaper here. These are the, the months. Uh, there's, a, there's a newspaper every week and every newspaper has four pages. And what I'm doing is going through every single article and uh, noting it and color coding it so I can get back to it. It's, it's a wonderful thing to do, actually. The writing's very good, it's very witty, it's very funny, it's a great thing to do. And um, then I classify uh, because it's too um, smudgy and dirty to, uh, to OCR to, to, to run a machine over it and, and recognize the text. So I'm actually going through it manually. And you can see I'm, uh, it's either about corruption in the ministry, uh, Wilkes, uh, the, there's a whole story on its own, but uh, Wilkes came to Lewis while Payne was here. And Wilkes was very famous in America, Wilkes for Liberty. Uh, Wilkes, who the corrupt king of the ministry wouldn't let him take his seat, even though he won the election for Middlesex. And so that's what that looks like. Um, so, on the whole, this, is a, this has been a new story. This has taken a long time, but we've got it out there now. It's just starting to get recognised in America. Uh, it's, for the first time, we have Payne's progress through the exercise service in one continuous timeline. We've never had that before. And then that would have been very important to Payne. That's where he got his wages from, all his, all his work people. It's where he saw the corruption. It's where he was selected to write the case. Very important to him. And thrust him onto the world stage. He's plucked from obscurity. This is the making of Payne. This is the rise of Thomas Payne. And so the next thing I'm on to now, which is the research, which it looks like the Americans would like to work with me on this. I'm very pleased to find a partner on it. It's been a bit lonely over the last eight years. So uh, there we are. That's the book. Um, this is the book. Um, it's, it's available as a Kindle, a fairly cheap Kindle download. A lot of people are doing that. Or you can buy it print on demand all over the world. It's available now. All profits from both books go back to the society. And I'm very pleased to say that Melvin Bragg, our president, thought the book was okay and what more helped me. And he said, I explained the rise of Thomas Paine, which is where I got the title from. So I think that's all about, I can say no, it's been about half an hour. So thank you for your kind attention and uh, back to you, Leonard. Thank you. I'll mute myself. Right. Okay. So um, there is a reaction button on your screens, folks, uh, at the bottom. So um, if you if you wanted to do an applause or a thumbs up, now would be a, a moment to do that. Well, once we get out of Paul's screen. Yeah, let me stop sharing. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, I can see one one thumb up already. I can uh, I can only see to. Uh, I'll stop the share. There we go. That's okay. It. Right. Okay. Good. But oh, and and and. <laughs> yes, that works too, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you. So, if you want to ask a question, if you can type it in um, at, uh, using that chat screen, then what uh, Paul will do will be read out the uh, question and then and then answer it directly. So, um, I can see it. Uh, you can see it. Yeah. yeah so, if anybody has a question. Uh, yeah. Please go ahead. I'm actually interested in, in, in a bit more about what an excise officer did. You, you, did you, you talked about gauges and things like that, but it, it sounds very technical. What exactly was an excise officer? Uh, well, he, he would go around and assess uh, the, there was excise levied on inland commodities. So um, things like candles, um, brewing, um, uh, you name it. There's a there's a long long list. There's a there's a big book on this. I say in the book where we get to it. But it's it's considered a, a, almost a dark art. Uh, Oliver Goldsmith writes in a deserted village that um, 
Uh, he's talking about how clever the, the schoolmaster was, and it's, it, it's even rumoured that he could gauge as well. So it was a very rare skill. If you can imagine these stills and um, brewing vessels, a, a, a very uh, convoluted shape. So you had to be capable of, of taking certain measurements and then taking readings of gravity and assessing the amount of alcohol that was in the brew at any certain time. Um, that was just just one of them. There was tax on excise on tea. It was a hated tax as well. They, were, they weren't popular, these people. But some of them were loved, like Thomas Tipper, who lived around here, uh, was a brewer himself. And Payne was a tobacconist in Lewis as well. When, when, he, when he married Elizabeth Olive, dad died, Payne moved back into the house and they run a tobacconist business there. So it was quite common. So I think the relationships were... I suspect very Robin Hood-like, actually. I think excise men were in a position of power, but they they made their lives comfortable, I think. But clever people, yeah, for sure. Okay, we've got a few questions uh, coming through yeah. now, have you, yeah? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, the, so, not well-born, but obviously educated. Yes, he was educated in Thetford Grammar School. His father was a Quaker who had been tossed out because he married uh, Francis Cock, the Anglican wife. Uh, he was educated at um, a commercial school, they called it at that time, under instruction not to, not to learn any classics from the Quaker background. Um, so he, he had certainly had some education. He, he learnt um, the skills Later, he trained under his father as a stonemaker, uh, a checker career. Uh, so he, he operated that trade. His first marriage to Mary Lamb in Dover, near Dover. Her father was an excise officer, and it looks like he, he uh, encouraged Payne to have a go. Um, Mary died, we think, in childbirth, and the child didn't survive. Payne moved back home, and his father. Um, his mother, Francis Cock, uh, got him an interview with the attorney. You had to be connected, and Francis Cock was connected, or Francis Payne was connected, and she got him the interview, and he would have received his training up there, up back up in Thetford. So that's 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 where that's where he got that training from. Uh, the next question from Teresa, that was from Biddy Fisher from Teresa Easton. Uh, did did. Did it influence his future policy? Absolutely it did, I think, if you read the case. And by the way, I do reproduce the case in its original form in this book, because it hasn't been out there often enough. It's, um, the last time it was printed was about 1806, I think, something like that, a long time ago. Um, although it's, it's, in, uh, it's in volumes, it's not on its own, and I analyse it for the first time here. And that's exactly why I say it. This is where he learned human nature. And uh, so he fits, Payne fits in the working class movement library because it's the first unionisation. He also fits in the American Philosophical Society because he, um, his experience of working in exercise was one of human nature. There's a little phrase in there where he says that a man who's corrupt because he can't feed his family, who steals because he can't feed his family, should not be prosecuted. He needs to feed his family. He's got to do what he's got to do. If, you, if you're poor and starving and you've got children to feed and a wife, you know, the whole lot to keep, you do whatever it takes. However, if a rich man steals, he deserves the gibbet. So he, he does this reductive philosophy of human nature. And I think he exactly learns his close up and personal in, his, in what he saw the suffering, he describes the suffering in, in, in the case where he lends fellow, uh, fellow excise officers money himself because they're in such dire straits. So he, he saw life on the edge there in all his forms, not only people hot, starving, hungry, desperate, also being very unfairly treated up close and personal. He, he suffered that himself. So yes, absolutely. Thank you for that question. So Chad, how great to see you, Chad. How are you doing, mate? So uh, when did Payne become a committed Republican? Well, that's a good question, because he wasn't in Lewis, I don't think. I rather suspect that George Lewis Scott planted that seed. 
because he said later when he was describing that amiable old gent who described the traditions of the royal family i think they that, that george lewis scott skill spilled the beans he was prepared for a republican state in lewis and he writes this in the rights of man because lewis ran without any hand of the crown in it it was run by a court league which Payne sat, sat on the government here so it wasn't a society of 12 it wasn't a, um, a mayor and corporation, um, both self-selecting societies that, that aped the crown, if you like. It was a Norman device here for reasons of, uh, Lewis was a regicide town, uh, uh, the, the MP actually uh, signed the death warrant for Charles I. It was changed by Charles II into the Norman device, of court beat, which was more open grained. You didn't have to be a freeman to do business in Lewis. And Payne sat on the court beat as a juryman. And he also sat in the vestry administering the poor law. So he said most towns in Lewis are actually run like a republic state. So I think we could claim the state of the, the state of the, well, not right now, but the United States of America as a republic. And Payne could pen that later because he'd lived it in Lewis. So thank you for that, Chad. Nice to see it. Nice to hear from you again. Um, Nick, yeah. Thank you, you've been to the rest. That's, yeah, that's a question. So, uh, John, to everyone, how did the North government react to Payne personally? Um, I don't, I think he was just too lowly here at that time. I don't think they reacted. Oh, this is later, isn't it? When they, when they defamed him, they were frightened at that time. So Chalmers wrote uh, The Life of Payne, uh, uh, employed by the Pitt government, paid 500 pounds, a huge amount of money at that time. And you think excise men, when Payne wrote the case, were, were on just about 50 pounds a year, but they had to pay their horse and lodging down that. They ended up on very, very uh, low money. So you imagine 500 pounds was, was an awful lot of money, not that long after. Um, they were frightened. Uh, Payne had in uh, the Rice Man Part One uh, stood up for the French Revolution, and they were very frightened that was going to happen here. So, I think there was real fear. That's how they reacted to pain. That they thought they thought there was going to be a revolution in this country as well, the same way as there was in France. They were terrified of that. that that's that's why Chalmers was set to work. Um, uh, Steve Roman. Uh, what action did the officers take after their petition was re rejected? Well, not, 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 it gradually got there. Uh, after about 30 years, every single thing that Payne said was adopted. And the extraordinary thing about this is when, when we first started researching this, I discovered that uh, Graham Smith was the excise archivist at the time I started this. He'd just, he'd written a couple of, he'd noted Payne. Uh, he, he noted that the excise service had adopted every recommendation by Payne. Colin Bren, uh, the, the eminent local Lewis historian who helped me write the first book, writes an essay in it and, and has studied me all through the years. He's a wonderful man. Um, he claims that, that because Payne said, if you run, what Payne was saying is if you pay people enough, they can be honest. They, 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 you can run an impeccable service. And Payne laid the blueprint here, if you like, for, for, the, for an impeccable civil service, which enabled us to build an empire, it enabled us to run India with, I don't know how many people, was it about 300 people? So if they're honest, they can do it. And the, the, the lovely thing was that they, the excise service up until quite recently in their headquarters had a bust of, Tom, of uh, Robert Burns and a bust of Thomas Payne. They knew what he'd done for the service. And when you think about that, because it was straightened out, they used, you know, whether directly or indirectly, they used his recommendations in the case. It supplied enough money for the Hanoverians and the subsequent royal families to live the way that they have done ever since. So they should be thankful for Thomas Paine uh, in a way that they may not have been. So um, that was that. We've got some nice thank yous uh, there, but yeah. that, has anybody else got a got a question? That does sound quite a good a, a good note to 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 end on. But I wouldn't want to cut anybody off if there's anybody wanted to type away there. 
I'll, uh, I'll just, I'll, I will give, I can see at least one member of our volunteer exhibition team um, um, here at the moment. So I, I must remember to give um, a, a plug to our still current Thomas Paine exhibition. It is, it is still up in the library. Sadly, we are not able to uh, welcome you there. However, what, what we have done is uploaded to the, the events page for the exhibition, the booklet, uh, which is the accompanying uh, booklet to, to that exhibition, uh, very well illustrated, and it contains all the text from the exhibition boards, which our, our volunteer team have, uh, have put together over, over many months. So I would encourage you to head back to the events page for, for two reasons. Uh, one, to go and have a look at that. Uh, and the other is that we will be uploading um, this talk. Uh, we'll be uploading it to our YouTube page, but we'll put the link also on the, on the events page for today. So if you missed the start or uh, whatever, or you want to let other people know you've enjoyed it, then, then you'll be able to pass on the, uh, the web address for the talk. Uh, oh, hang on, we have got another one coming up there. How do the Americans feel about pain these days? Oh, there's an interest. Okay, let's have that as our last question. Right, okay. Okay, Lee, thank, thank you for that. Yes, good question. Uh, he's one of the lesser known, he is one of the lesser known founding fathers, but he is acknowledged as a founding father. Um, it, most, most presidents use his words. Barack Obama used his words in both his inaugural speeches as did many other presidents. He's claimed by the left and the right. Uh, he's claimed by the right because Payne advocated for small government. Um, and he's, he's advocated by the left because he, he laid out a social welfare state in Rising Man Part Two, and um, agrarian justice is, is very important as well. So uh, he's broadly acknowledged, but not he's, not he's not in the same bracket as Washington or Franklin or the others. Although we're, we, we continue to work on this. He, he um, is, is a bit there where he attacked George Washington in the end, he was incarcerated in Luxembourg. Joe is a bit of a story, but he, he did go on the attack a bit afterwards. Uh, he wrote uh, Age of Reason, which, alien, uh, which he, he was a day of speaking, like organized religion, and he, and he called the Christians the worst of the lot. The Americans didn't, weren't too keen on that at that time. And so he's been a bit suppressed, but we're, there's a small group of us working on it. So uh, hopefully he, he's been on a stamp and there are some uh, statues, but, 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 but they, uh, what's interesting is his common sense, his document that Kendall War of Independence is required reading in every uh, primary school or, or whatever they call it over there. Not, not infant, but a bit, a bit older. So everyone's heard of him. Everyone, everyone knows about it, but he's not revered in the same way. So that was it. Yeah, thank okay. you. All right. He was certainly revered by uh, the library's founders, Ruth and Eddie Frau. And uh, it, uh, our pain collection is a fantastic thing. And uh, we look forward in the future to to have Paul come up and, and see it and, uh, and have uh, the rest of you come along if you haven't been able to get to Salford to see it either but in the meantime we want to say thank you very much again huge thanks to Paul for uh, uh, being alongside us in this interesting new format and thanks to all of you for, for joining us we're aiming to do the same again this time next week with a talk by Ralph Darlington on the pre-first world war labour unrest and women's suffrage revolt and you can sign up to find out more about this and other future events at our, um, our our e-newsletter page you can click on the subscribe to e-bulletin button on the top right of our website that's probably the easiest way of doing it and i've mentioned again keep an eye on our events page wcml.org.uk forward slash events and as i say this talk has been recorded too it'll be uploaded to our youtube channel shortly that's youtube.com forward slash wcml library and a reminder that our talks are as ever free, but if you are able to support the library, we would very much appreciate it. And the page to click to there is wcml.org.uk forward slash donate. So thanks again, Paul and everybody else, and goodbye until the next time, this time next week. Take care, in solidarity, very best wishes from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Bye bye. Bye bye.
this is it yes people can can 